Part of my heart in bringing you these teachings is to show you how much value there is in every single page of this book. So many pastors these days take their one or two favorite verses on whatever they're wanting to teach about, and then they expound upon it in their own opinion, instead of staying inside the Bible and using the Bible to explain itself. There's so much encouragement, so much direction, so much value. See, even, even Paul telling Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says in verse 14, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. In, in, in other words, Paul is telling Timothy, look, everything written in this book is really, really important. It is inspired by God that men with their pens writing that what came and what was ended up in the canon of the scriptures were led by the Holy Spirit to make points about our lives and about how to be righteous and godly. The word of God tells us how to write, how to live right, how not to live wrong, how to get right and how to stay right, how to be righteous and holy before a holy God. And so my heart has always been to bring to you sections of the Bible you may never have met before, you've never seen with your eyes. Isaiah chapter 65 is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous chapter. Isaiah is a prophet far long before Jesus, and he's speaking of a time that has yet still in the future. We're coming up on that point now. It's full of encouragement. It's full of direction. It's full of a warning for those who don't believe in God. And in doing so, I was greatly blessed, and I want to bring it to you. It says in chapter 65 of Isaiah, the Lord says, I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I said, here am I, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. All day long, I opened my arms to a rebellious people, but they follow their own evil paths and their own crooked schemes. All day long they insult me to my face, my worshiping idols in their sacred gardens. They burn incense on pagan altars. At night they go out among the graves worshiping the dead. They eat the flesh of pigs and make stews with other forbidden foods. Yet they say to each other, don't come too close or you'll defile me. I'm holier than you. These people are a stench in my nostrils and an acrid smell that never goes away. God is saying, look... I was here, ready to help you in your difficulties, ready to help you call on me. I was ready, but no one no one called on me. Is it possible that we're going through the things in our nation right now? We're going through all of this because people didn't call on God. God was ready to help our holy nation, a, a nation that was built under the word and precious thoughts of our God. He said, do you want your help? Call on me. I'm here. I was ready. But no one did. Everyone stayed in their wickedness. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, it says here, yet they say to each other, don't come close to me or you'll defile me for I am holier than you. People say, ah, oh, it's, it's explained in another place in the Bible. People who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Being holy without understanding that God is the one who makes us holy. We're, we become hypocritical. Well, I'm going to do all these wicked things, but, but don't do it because I'm better than you. Don't come close to me with your wicked things because my wicked things aren't as wicked as your wicked things. I mean, this is the stuff that these people are saying. God is saying, this is how you are. He says, look, you're, you're a horrible stench to me. Verse 6, look, my decree is written out in front of me. I will stand silent. I will not stand silent. I will repay them in full. Yes, I will repay them both for our sins 
and their sins and for those of their ancestors, says the Lord. For they also burned incense on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will pay them back in full. This is from a righteous God, a God who cannot put up with sin. Because he is merciful, but because he is just, well, a sinful person is wicked and a sinful person must be put to death unless that debt of sin has been paid off by Jesus Christ dying on the cross for them. That's the whole transaction. That's, this is something that's not being spoken of yet because Jesus hasn't come. So he's saying, if you're a sinner, I will repay all of this wickedness and all of this horrible idolatry that you're paying against me. Verse 8, but I will not destroy them all says the Lord. For just as good grapes are found among a cluster of bad ones, and someone will say, don't throw away them all, some of the grapes are good. So I will not destroy all of Israel, for I still have true servants there. I will preserve a remnant of the people of Israel and of Judah to possess my land. Those I choose will inherit it, and my servants will live there. The plain of Sharon will again be filled with flocks for my people who have searched for me, and the valley of Achor will be a place of pasture and herds. He's saying, look, I'm going to leave a remnant. Amongst all the people of the world, there are a, there is a remnant, a small group, a population of people who never bowed down to other idols, who looked and seek and sought after me, who lived righteous and followed my laws. Now, now in today's vernacular, those are those who are believers, those who believe in Jesus Christ. Not necessarily Christians, but disciples, those who follow Christ, who understand the value of being born again. God says, I won't destroy everyone, there's still a remnant of people that I will save because there are good people amongst the bad. Verse 11, but because the rest of you have forsaken the Lord and have forgotten his temple and because you have prepared feasts to honor the God of fate and have offered mixed wine to the God of destiny, now I will destine you for the sword. All of you will bow down before the executioner, for when I call, you did not answer, and when I spoke, you did not listen. You deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what you know I despise. Here's God saying, oh, you, you, got to, you got yourself into karma and destiny and fate, believing these kind of new age ideas that you yourself are God and that everything just kind of works in the universe without God having his hand on it. And so he said, look, oh, he plays against them. If you believe in destiny, then I will destine you for destruction. You've got, a full, you've got to lean on me, the creator. And so you've gone on and I will be your de executioner and I will destroy you because you have decided to f lean on fate and lean on yourself and lean on these idols that don't breathe and don't do anything. God's really angry here. But this is a warning. If you don't know God, if you don't believe in God, if you haven't accepted Jesus then you will be destroyed. The Bible throughout every page of this book is clear that if you don't lean on the creator, but instead lean on his created or your created or your developed or your belief, it's outside his parameters, then you have nowhere else to go but to die. Verse 13, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat but you will starve. My servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be sad and ashamed. My servants will sing for joy, but you will cry in sorrow and despair. Your name will be a curse word among my people, for the sovereign Lord will destroy you and will call his true servants by another name. All who invoke a blessing or take an oath will do so by God by the God of truth, for I will put aside my anger and forget the evil of earlier days. Very clearly, God says there are two types of people. Those who are saved and those who are lost. Those who are saved will eat and drink and have joy, rejoice in joy, and, and will not have despair and will live upon God forever. Those who do not will starve and be thirsty. They will be sad and ashamed. They will be in sorrow and despair. 
this this is clear of what our life is now. You think people falling under the bottle and under pills and under suicide, not knowing the Lord, but following under these problems, and these problems are only going to get worse. But those who are your servants, those who you are are your servants, God, are the ones who will be filled, will be blessed, as we read in Matthew chapter 5. Look, I am creating new heavens and new earth, something that's happened, not even happened yet, something at the end even of the book of Revelation. I am creating new heavens and new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. How, how awesome is that? Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation, and look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the wounds and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. The Bible speaks of a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth, where there's no pain or suffering, sickness or death. There's no, it's only joy and happiness and perfection for eternity. But you have to be part of God's servants not of those who are wicked and idolatrous, those who are being destroyed by the sword. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they've lived a full life. <clears throat> no longer will people be considered old at 100 and eat the fruit of their own. Um, only the cursed will die that young. In those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruits of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards, for my people will live as long as trees. And my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune, and their children too will be blessed, for my people are blessed by the Lord. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow, but the snakes will eat dust. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. God is speaking power through the prophesying of Isaiah. He's saying, look, I was there, but you didn't want it. If you ch don't choose me, you will die. But if you do, then I have set aside to you a plan of a future that will be wonderful for you, that no one will die, that you will live a long life, that no one will take your stuff. There won't be any taxes. All of these things that we suffer from now, that we toil from now, that we overwork for underpaid now will not exist then. And you will forget about the world we live in. These are interesting points made at the end of this prophecy. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. You realize that God already knows what you need before you ask. He just wants to see if your heart is in tune with him. He provides before it even happens. We see in, in the book of Joshua when, they, when, the, when the priests walk into the Jordan River to make it split. Did you know that the Jordan River stopped 18 miles away? It started before they even walked into the water. So that seamlessly when they stepped into the water, the water stopped. And the water was cleared and the whole entire nation of Israel walked across the Jordan River a mile wide with, on, on dry ground, it says. That's, God works outside of our view, outside of our life, moving mountains we cannot see. So that when we walk up and we ask for it, it's already in work. That's what he's saying here. Those who believe and those who live on the will of God and live a holy life, God's already answering prayers for you, even the ones you didn't know you needed. And chapter and verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. They won't eat each other. They will they will eat together. The lion will eat like a cow. In heaven, we'll go back to where Eden was. When animals didn't eat each other, there was no meat eating back then. Men stood over and had dominion over animals. And we can see that in other places where kids will play with snakes and all kinds of crazy stuff. 
we we won't be we won't be at odds with the animal kingdom anymore. They will be our servants. I hope really that we can even talk to them. Because it's understood that in the book of, of Genesis that Adam could speak to them. He gave them all by names. He gave them all names. He couldn't find one that was a good friend to him. And so God made woman. This is the point. <laughs> you have a choice. Back in the Exodus and back in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, um, God always is coming to Moses and saying, look, look, people of Israel, you, I, I place before you a choice. Live or die. That's what he's saying here. If you, if you, if you keep on your wickedness, you will die. If you seek my face and be my servant, you will live. Those are the only two choices. You will be blessed if you choose me. You will be destroyed if you don't. And here's what I, I hope that all of this grabs your heart. It grabs your heart like, like the people were grabbed after Peter's uh, sermon in, 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 the, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, filled with the Spirit, stands up and he professes the very, the very gospel of Jesus Christ. All these people are wondering what's going on. But the Word of God has tremendous power. And what it does is it leads these people to this point. Verse, uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 37 says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have called and been called by the Lord of our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. We live in a crooked generation. There's no doubt that as you're looking in the news, watch the news. And is it possible that on all of the wickedness and all of the the fraud and this voter and this and all of the stuff going on do, do you think that maybe god has opened up the book to see the wickedness lurking for righteous people to stand up and stand in the gap to do what is right but it says here in this bible that you i i you, i was there ask me for help i was there to help you but you didn't and i can only believe that in the midst of this crooked generation, this generation where God is flowing out of schools, out of the government, out of even the churches these days, that he is, his call, his waiting for us to call is falling on deaf ears. And he's made that very clear warning in Isaiah. If you choose me, I will bless you. If you don't, you will be destroyed. If you believe that you live under faith and car fate and karma and destiny and the new world order and you're your own God and you make your own decisions and nothing ever, no one ever occurs. There's, there's so much evidence that God exists that if you say no, you don't, you're, you're without excuse. You're without excuse. He will destine you to the sword. There's only two types of people, those who have chosen God and those who reject God in his son, Jesus Christ. Remember that we are all sinners, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we must regain that glory to spend eternity with him. Jesus came and laid his own life down, murdered by men, but he did it he did it intentionally so that the blood that he would shed would wash over and, and handle all of your sins. That the blood would cleanse your sins. His broken body and the hatred and suffering that he endured would pay the price and the wrath of God that you are it's, you're waiting to face. Jesus took it upon himself. All you have to do is believe. Rege turn from your sins. Repent. To repent is to say, I'm sorry, but to change everything about it, to turn away and walk away from it and stop doing it. It is a heart issue to repent of your sins and to seek God with all your heart. And he will hear your prayers before you even ask. Take it from me. He's changed my life in so many ways, in so many wonderful ways. 
And I haven't even seen the new heavens and the new earth yet. And I haven't lived in the new body that he has promised me through the promises of God. And I haven't even lived for eternity in perfection. And I haven't had a pet lion in heaven. Man, all of this stuff is so cool. But take it as a warning if you don't know. Be ready. Be pricked to the heart. Repent and turn away and seek the Lord and be saved. I hope this reaches you. I hope it pricks you to the bone. I hope that you're looking that the Bible has more and more and more lovely direction than anything else that's out here. Don't, don't lean on man. Don't lean on men. Don't worry about men. Seek God and he'll protect you. Be blessed this week. See ya.